Good evening. I think that by now many people have heard about the reported discovery of a new planet. And I don't mean a planet in our own solar system. This is a planet of a neutron star, something like 30,000 light years away. And this is a real surprise because a neutron star is the last kind of place where you would expect to find a planet. Two of the planets in our own solar system, the two brightest, are in the morning sky now. There is Jupiter in Leo the Lion, and lower down, and even brighter, there is Venus. And these two are quite dissimilar. Jupiter is a huge body, more than a thousand times the volume of the Earth, and with the telescope, you will see a yellowish, flattened disk crossed by cloud belts. And that was a sketch I made a few mornings ago with my 15-inch telescope. Venus is about the same size as the Earth, at the moment, rather more than half its lighted side is turned towards us, but we can't see the actual surface because it's always hidden by a dense layer of cloud. Although now, thanks to the Magellan probe, we do know what Venus is like. But in our own solar system, there are altogether nine planets going around the Sun at different distances and at different speeds. And of those, all, with the exception of Pluto, have now been explored by spacecraft. But what about planets of other stars? And here we're on very much less certain ground. Let me show you a rather interesting picture. This is a star field. Uh, in fact, it's su superimposed three views taken over a period of several years. And since the stars appear to remain in virtually the same positions, they are superimposed. But there's one that is not. Look near the middle, and you will see three dots. And they are the images of a nearby red dwarf called Barnard's star, which is only six light years away. And does have a definite proper or individual motion against the background of more distant stars. Now, it's been suggested that as Barnard's star goes along, it is wobbling very slightly, as though it's being pulled by some unseen companion, which may well be a planet. That's the suggestion. Uh, it may well be true. On the other hand, there are doubts about the instrumentation, and we can't be sure. And certainly, we can't see planets of other stars. They are too faint and too small. But there is one other way. Cool material gives out infrared radiation. And way back in 1983, the infrared astronomical satellite, IRIS, reported cool material around certain bright stars, one of which was the brilliant blue Vega, and another was Beta Pictoris in the Southern Hemisphere. And there's an actual picture of the material around Beta Pictoris. There, bear in mind, that is a false color picture. So can there be planets going around these stars? Well, there could be. But again, we can't be sure, and we cannot see any planets of other stars. So how can we tell that they're there? And this reported new planet has not been seen at all. This has been detected by radio observations made with the Lovell Telescope at George Royal Bank. The leader of the team is Professor Andrew Lyne. We're delighted to welcome him back to the sky at night again. Welcome, Andrew. First of all, we've been talking about neutron stars, but not everyone will know what they are. So what exactly is a neutron star? A neutron star is the condensed core of a very massive star um, after the, which forms after the star has burnt up most of its nuclear fuel. It doesn't have enough energy to hold itself up against gravity and the central part of the star, star collapses uh, to form this very dense neutron star. Now it does this in a very violent explosion and most of the mass of the star is blasted away into space and we can see um, such a uh, situation in the Crab uh, supernova remnant here where we see all this gas which has been um, blasted away and in the center of this there is one star which is unlike all the other stars which uh, radiate just because of the, the hot surface of the star. Um, the radiation from this star uh, comes in the form of pulses um, 30 times a second. And that's why these neutron stars are so often called pulsars. Yes that's right. They are very rapidly rotating bodies when the core of the star collapses so it does a pirouette in the same way that a ballerina does when she brings in her limbs and spins herself up so the star which might have been rotating perhaps once every few hours or once a day um, ends up rotating many times a second and uh, they also have associated with them uh, very intense magnetic fields um, which uh, so that you essentially have a very rapidly rotating bar magnet and charged particles come out of these uh, magnetic poles and form a beam of radio emission. Now, as this beam of radio emission rotates, so every time it uh, crosses the line of sight to the Earth, uh, we receive a pulse of emission from it, and hence a pulsar. What's the real importance of studying pulsars? Well, there are a number of uh, reasons why we study them. 
they're fundamental properties. They make very good clocks. They're a big flywheel mm -hmm. spinning around, and they've got these ticks. Now, um, most pulsars are slowing down rather gradually as they lose energy, uh, but we can predict exactly when pulses are going to come with a period and the rate at which the period's slowing down. Um, we can predict a series of arrival times. Now, if we've got a good, mo good slowdown model, when we subtract these model arrival times from the observed arrival times, we should end up with zero um, times. In fact, we end up with small quantities called residuals. And so from a nice, smoothly rotating pulsar, we end up with uh, a, a sequence of residuals rather like this, where they're mostly round about, round about zero. This shows observations over about th a three-year period. Now, um, we can use this clock-like behavior to study the insides of neutron stars. Uh, it's, they're made of the dense, some of the con most condensed matter known in the universe, and it's about the only place we can really study them. Now, they're very much like uh, the, uh, an egg, in that they've got a solid crust and, uh, and a fluid interior. And if I can just demonstrate what happens with an egg when you spin it, you can learn a lot about what goes on inside. A raw egg, I take it. This is a raw egg, yes. If, uh, a cooked egg wouldn't behave in the same way. Now, if I spin this egg up and stop it briefly, um, you'll, and then let go, you'll see something strange happening. I can get it going fast enough. I stop it and take my hand off. Yeah. And you'll notice that it spins up again. And that's because the fluid inside the egg, when I stop it, the fluid inside the egg keeps rotating. I take my hand off, and the rotation of the fluid is then transferred to the egg, and it spins up again. Well, we see um, some of these neutron stars, or pulsars, change their rotation rate rather suddenly occasionally, particularly young ones, when they, they have sort of star quakes, and their rotation rate changes abruptly, and by studying what happens immediately after those, we can see evidence for fluid inside. So we can study the material inside the stars. But we can also study um, things when they're, uh, study other situations, for instance, when they're in orbit around other stars, or other neutron stars sometimes. And uh, such studies have led to a very accurate confirmation of Einstein's theory of relativity, and have also given us uh, the first observational evidence for the existence of gravitational waves. Of course, at George Bank, you've been carrying out a systematic survey for new pulsars, haven't you? Yes, uh, in order to find, uh, in order to get pulsars in which we can do these sorts of studies, uh, we need to first find them. And uh, about six years ago, 1985, we carried out a survey in which we discovered 40 new pulsars. One of which was, uh, 39 of them behaved fine, but one of them, uh, was rather strange. This was rotating about three times a second. And this, of course, brings us on to the new planet. And at this stage, I'm delighted to introduce the other members of your team, Dr. Matthew Bales and Set Namshima. Matthew, what drew your attention to this particular pulsar, and why is it known as 1829 minus 10? Well, astronomers have a coordinate system that they've applied to the, the sky, and it's a bit like longitude and latitude. And the name 1829 minus 10 just refers to the pulsar's position on the sky. Now you can see the position of the pulsar on your screen there. It's in the constellation Scutum. Now I should point out that you, that you won't be able to see this pulsar um, with your naked eye or an optical telescope. You can only see it with a radio telescope. And it lies on the galactic plane and that's the white line running down the right side of the screen. Now what drew our attention to this pulsar was that it was the only one out of 40 that had been discovered in 1985 for which we couldn't accurately predict when the pulse would arrive at the telescope. So when I arrived, the evidence, or its spin-down history, if you like, was shown on the graph here. And if it was a normal pulsar, um, we should have been able to accurately predict it, and all of the points would lie along the line like they do there. But instead, what we had was this rather messy plot, and we just couldn't make head nor tail of all these points. So it was decided that we should observe this pulsar much more regularly. So every day that we had the telescope, we took an observation of the pulsar, and we built up much more data. Now, it was one of our students' tasks to p process this pulsar, as well as numerous other ones. And that's where you came in, Setna. He made this very interesting discovery. Can you tell us exactly what happened? I came across this pulsar, first of all, in May, and Andrew and I analysed some data on it. And Soon after, I realised that there was something, that there was a small difference for the data for this pulsar than other pulsars I'd looked at. 
some of the pulse, some of the pulses in some of the data appeared to be arriving slightly early and some pulses seem to be arriving slightly late and I was able to draw a line through the data points and show that the that the fluctuations were almost periodic with a period of about six months and further analysis showed that previous data going back to almost five years ago also contained the periodic effect. I then began to think that it was um, possible that the pulsar had a companion and that the pulsar was orbiting the center of mass of a binary system and that when it was moving towards us the pulses were arriving slightly early and as it moved away the pulses started were arriving slightly late um, due to the extra light travel time and I later found that the companion would have to be a planetary sized mass well, this is interesting, isn't it? Andrew, can I come back to you? After all, we believe that um, a pulsar is a supernova remnant, which is unbelievably violent. Surely, that would destroy any orbiting planet. Yes, the planet would have to survive at least three main hazards in that explosion. The initial one is the expansion of the pre-supernova star, when in its red giant phase, the envelope of the star was, would likely engulf any nearby planets and certainly cook the... Um, those planets. The final collapse of the star and the resulting explosion would mainly result in the ma loss of a large amount of mass from the central star or gravitational glue and so that the orbital velocity of the planet may now be uh, may now exceed the escape velocity from the star and it will go flying off into space. Uh, the final hazard of course was the violence of the uh, material which is blasted out from the central star, that's going to impact upon the planet um, and will certainly do it no good at all. To get around this problem, is it possible that this particular pulsar was formed in a different way, not involving a supernova outburst at all? Well, it's possible that the collapse was accompanied by a much less violent um, explosion. For instance, a star less massive than the one in the Crab Nebula uh, probably uh, would not end up as, would not collapse to a neutron star and there's probably a critical mass somewhere between um, the Sun and a more massive star where by the time the collapse occurs there's very little mm. material left outside the, new, uh, outside the core and uh, so there's not much material to be blasted away into space. But even if there has been a tremendous explosion there, is it possible that the planet was either formed later or captured later from outer space? Yes, that seems the most likely um, explanation I think that the planet formed from a disk of material um, after the neutron star was formed. Normally when a star is formed um, there's a lot of other rubbish um, a, that condenses down um, in a disk around the star and it's possible that planets then form and condense out of this disk to form a s solar system perhaps like our own Sun. And the same sort of um, a process may well have occurred around a neutron star. But uh, it's the source of this material, which is yeah. uh, a, a debate. Um, it may have come from another star, for instance, if it was in a binary mm -hmm. system, um, or it's just possible that the uh, neutron star collided um, with, a, with another star. Um, this would form a thick disk from which uh, planets might form. Well, another thought strikes me. What we're saying really is that there's something there with a mass about ten times that of the Earth. But can you actually say it is a planet in the accepted sense of the term? Well, we do seem to think there is a, um, a condensed body of some sort rotating around the neutron star, but it is possible that there are other explanations for the periodicity that we've seen in the arrival times. Well, the period is six months. The Earth's period is twice six months. Is it possible that what you're getting is a reflection of the Earth's own motion around the Sun? Yes, it has been suggested that the delays that we've seen in the arrival times might be due to a cloud of gas, of plasma or something or other, fairly close to the solar system, um, but of the same sort of size as the solar system, which causes the signal to be delayed as the um, radiation passes through it. Um, as the radiation um, passes around the edges of this, this cloud of gas, so the delay will be much smaller um, and the pulses will arrive earlier. In this way, way we'd expect to get a six-month variation. However, 
when we actually compare the arrival times which we actually got, indeed the periodicity is uh, six months, but the, there is a difference in phase between the expected sinusoid and the observed by about 90 degrees. So that definitely doesn't work. That's right. Well, what about other possible explanations not involving a planet? Well, the two other explanations have been proposed. One is that uh, there's something to do with the fluid inside the neutron star. This isn't an ordinary fluid um, as we know it. This is probably a superfluid. And it may be that this fluid is sloshing around inside the neutron star, um, causing the crust to wobble backwards and forwards also and give rise to the uh, observed effect. The other possibility is that the star is processing, that the um, spin axis is wobbling a little bit like this every six months. And this would give rise to the observed effect that we see of a six-month advance and retard of the arrival times. But there would also be a couple of other observable effects. One is that the um, pulses would appear to have different width mm -hmm. uh, through the six months, and also that the amount of energy we received from the pulsar would vary on a six-month period. So all in all, you think it's a planet? Yes. Well, what's it like? Well, it's, uh, we don't know whether it's gaseous or solid. Um, we can't tell that. Uh, but uh, it will be receiving a rather similar amount of radiation to that that we observe from the um, sun. Um, it's roughly speaking, uh, about a kilowatt per square meter or so is landing on this planet from the, uh, from the central star. This radiation isn't in the normal form of heat and light, but uh, it's mostly gamma rays and very energetic particles and probably would not uh, uh, be very conducive to life. No, I would certainly imagine not. Matthew, are you hunting for more of these things? Yes, at the moment we've got surveys underway in both the northern and southern hemispheres looking for more pulsars and hopefully some of them will be as exotic as the one that had the planet. I wonder. Setnam, you found it. What do you think you found? Well, I have little doubt that our observations showing the periodic effect in the timing of PSR 1829-10 are correct. The simplest expl explanation still is that there is a planet in orbit around the pulsar. The more important question on my mind is how a planet actually got to being there. I wonder what it is. Certainly, I think we all agree that whatever it turns out to be, it's certainly the most puzzling discovery made for many years. Andrew, thank you very much. And thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Setnam. Next month, we're going on a different kind of journey. We're going to the top of Mauna Kea, 14,000 feet up, to have a look at the Keck telescope, now the most powerful in the world. So I hope you'll join me then. And meanwhile, if you want the latest astronomical information, you can always contact the Sky at Night information line on 0898 666 North North North, or you can dial in for CFAX, page 616. And so, until next month, good night.